Uh, I just want to say one thing before we begin, which is um, you didn't submit the results of your discussion. What happened? Did you have a discussion? Uh, what's going on? Please uh, write to me or contact me and let me know what's going on. And if uh, you did hold a discussion, you're always free to post a late summary uh, of your discussion, even after having watched this lecture. Uh, who knows, maybe you even uh, may have further thoughts on the things I talk about, and we can continue the discussion. Um, but please tell me what's going on here. Okay, question one. From the author's description, do you think the hospital's attitude toward its anorexia patients helped treatment? Why or why not? And if not, what might have been a better attitude? So uh, all four groups, all of you said that the hospital's attitude did not help treatment. Uh, some of you mentioned that it was aggressive uh, and that it didn't try to understand the patient, treated the patient with prejudice, and I agree. Now, there's obviously a reason why they would be doing that. And, uh, you know, doctors don't do things just for the fun of it. Um, apparently, uh, when anorexia nervosa was uh, first created as a mental illness category, uh, doctors had a preconceived idea of why people would starve themselves. Um, and as the essay mentions, uh, the, the disease is mostly connected or uh, it's uh, when people think of it, they usually think of uh, young women. And of course, this has a lot to do with the way that patriarchal cultures uh, value women for their, you know, youth and beauty and like child rearing and bearing properties, things like that. Um, so women often feel more pressure to stay slim. Slim doesn't necessarily mean in shape or healthy, but simply uh, slim and skinny. Um, so this uh, history of the disease affected how doctors at first thought about it. Um, and as you might have guessed from the essay, early doctors simply assumed that these young women uh, loved being skinny and that's why they were starving themselves. And so for early doctors, the point wasn't whether uh, what uh, they were doing is leading to bad effects, but whether the patient herself or themselves uh, could understand that their behavior was not normal, was un was mentally unhealthy uh, as the starting point. Now, uh, the essay uses the metaphor of confession, uh, but the the method here is more connected to psychoanalysis, Jing uh, Zhenxi, which itself has many problems. Um, earliest psychoanalysis from uh, Freud in the late 19th century uh, w were in total control of the interpretation of the mental illness. Uh, the only thing the patient was allowed to do was to admit that the doctor's interpretation was correct. Uh, and so, of course, many times the doctor was incorrect and it caused more harm. Uh, psychoanalysis today, it still exists as a medical discipline. Uh, psychoanalysis today is very different from what it was at first. Um, but sometimes this problem can still come up in which the doctor uh, guides the uh, discussion or the interpretation of the patient's mental health uh, according to their own theories and and uh, medical training instead of according to what the patient has themselves uh, experienced and uh, the way the patient themselves think. Um, so this is a, a quite traditional way of treating mental illness. Now, uh, the second part, what might have been, have been a better attitude, uh, all of you said, well, you know, maybe the doctor should listen. Maybe the doctor should have more empathy. And uh, this usually leads to better results because, as we now know, uh, mental illness 
has or can have different origins or, or causes uh, leading to the same or similar set of symptoms. Uh, so not everyone who starves themselves likes being skinny. There might be other problems, uh, compound factors uh, related to the disease. So, uh, of course, a more effective means of treatment is to find out what those causes are, uh, or you know, at least try to, to find out. Uh, on a more general level, uh, treating mental illness mentally, you know, instead of using medicine, but through therapy and talking, uh, is basically uh, based on the idea of interpretation and self-understanding. Uh, whether it's the, the traditional method or uh, current methods, uh, both emphasize that the patient should come to some kind of understanding about themselves and why they're doing this harmful behavior toward themselves. Uh, because the assumption is only when you understand what's going on can you find a way to try to change it. Uh, now, of course, in the traditional method, uh, the understanding the doctors wanted the patients to have may not be a, a true or accurate understanding. Uh, but that basic method of first understanding and then intervention uh, has not changed. Question two. The author says that in the West, a teenage girl's sexuality is one of the most volatile things there is. What do you think they mean? Uh, they here refers to the author. Uh, we'll discuss that in the next question, why I use the word they instead of, you know, she, as some of you do. Uh, but for this question, uh, I think a lot of you were confused by the word volatile. Uh, volatile, by definition, means it's easily changed or unstable. But in this essay, it has a more particular meaning. Let's take a look. Uh, so starting from the first line that I have selected here, uh, like Reagan in The Exorcist, she often speaks in vulgarities and references explicit sex acts. This sexuality, is, uh, so first of all, vulgarity means like cursing and saying bad words, things like that. Uh, this sexuality is precisely why the possessed person is dangerous, and so often why the possessed person is depicted as a teenage girl. So up to this point in the essay, we have a connection between uh, bad words, uh, sex, speaking about sex, connecting them to uh, demonic possession, danger, uh, and teenage girl. So you have these ideas being connected to each other. And then the sentence. In the West, a teenage girl's sexuality is one of the most volatile things there is. It's the monster in these films where the young girl is made to seem older through how she speaks. Uh, so even so, this, the sentence that I'm asking you about is uh, put in between a sandwich of these ideas. In, in the sentence, uh, after the sentence I chose, sentence, uh, uh, sexuality is a monster, and it's uh, a monster expressed that through the young girl, making the young girl seem older. And the way it does this is by changing the way that she speaks. And then the next sentence, the voice is deceptive. It's sexual and inviting, but it's also the voice of the devil. Uh, so first of all, it's a young girl, especially in... Uh, a lot of horror films, sometimes the girls aren't even uh, 18 yet. Uh, and the voice makes them seem older, and it's sexual and inviting, but it's dangerous because it's an evil voice. It's a voice of possession. Uh, so sexuality, first of all, is depicted as something dangerous, and it's also depicted as uh, connected to evil. And so the word volatile here I, I think means more like uh, dangerous, capable of causing harm, unpredictable, uh, or you can even say uh, uncontrollable, hard to control. And that brings us closer to uh, not only what the essay is talking about, but what I'm asking about, um, which is uh, why is it that in the West, let's look at this question. 
why it, it, why is it that in the West a teenage girl's sexuality is one of those most volatile, dangerous, seen as evil things there is? Um, so here in the essay, it's using uh, this convention or trope in the horror film as a starting point, and I'm I'm asking you, what does this common theme in horror films say about? Uh, young women's sexuality in Western culture. And, uh, you know, connecting it to uh, volatility, unpredictability, evil, danger. Uh, I, I think uh, what it says is that uh, the culture doesn't really know how to handle a young girl, especially a teenage girl's sexuality. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were talking about the uh, Madonna horror complex, about how under a patriarchy, men can only see women as saints or, or uh, sexual, purely sexual uh, people and nothing in between. Well, a teenage girl is exactly in between. As a lot of you mentioned, uh, teenage girls are going through puberty, they are experiencing hormones for the first time, they don't understand their own bodies and sexuality yet. Uh, and so, uh, on the one hand, they're kind of pre-sexual, innocent young girls, because they don't know how to control or how to to uh, come to terms with their newfound sexuality. So they aren't really sexual people yet. They're encountering it for the first time. But on the other hand, they are sexual in that they're no longer purely innocent young girls. They, they are experiencing sexuality. And so... Uh, the teenage girl is precisely the kind of woman that a patriarchy has trouble uh, defining, understanding, and controlling. Uh, because it, uh, the teenage girl doesn't fit clearly under either Madonna or whore. Uh, you know, saint or sex. Um, and this is one of the reasons why horror films uh, can be so important or illuminating to uh, the culture. It's because, uh, you know, if I if you had a movie where someone says everything I just said as dialogue, it's pretty boring. Uh, but horror films can use supernatural or unnatural uh, figures and events to explore these deeper uh, cultural relations uh, that we don't often talk about and that it can even be hard to pinpoint when you actually see a real-world example. Uh, so, and that kind of hints at uh, what question 5 will be talking about a little bit as well. Uh, one group said that uh, it shows how women in her period are hard to control. Let's see if I can find that. Here, this is group 5. In the author's period, women's social status is much lower than men. Um, sorry, Group 5, but this essay was written or published in 2018. So the author's period is your period. It's our period. Uh, and of course, it is true that women are still held at a lower social status than men are. Uh, but it's improved a lot since uh, like whenever you are thinking of. Uh, and it's improving more and more every year. Question three. Do you think the author's gender is man, woman, gender fluid, or non-binary? Why? Uh, does, and if so, how? Does, does their decision not, uh, not to have gender confirmation surgery influence your understanding? Okay, before I talk about your answers, uh, I want to clarify some of the terms that we use when we talk about sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Now, these terms are, uh, it, like when we talk about language evolution, these terms are evolving very quickly. Um, and if you ask, and someone actually did this uh, online, like someone once made, created a survey about something completely unrelated to gender or sex. Uh, and But for the data, one of the questions was, what is your gender? Uh, 
and the choices were uh you know man woman non-binary other and under other you can type in uh, what you think you you feel like your gender is um and there were so many different answers it was crazy well no it's not literally crazy crazy means you're insane and mentally ill so it, no it's not crazy but it was wild um so gender is a very uh open discussion and open debate uh we can talk about it intellectually academically uh to give you a basic understanding uh but if you meet someone in the real world or even online who says that their gender is something that you've never heard of uh and you can tell they're not joking uh it's best to to respect uh their identity self identity uh and instead of you know asking them questions and are you sure and what does that mean um because you know people who identify as uh unusual genders um often get those questions a lot and it can create a lot of pressure to repeatedly answer similar questions every time you meet someone new uh and you know in, if you're really curious you can look it up online or uh once you get to know them better maybe uh they'll be willing to be, have a friendly conversation with you about it um but you know it's not their responsibility to make you understand it's your responsibility to show every person basic human respect okay anyways here are the most common terms that you might encounter when talking about gender sex and sexual orientation so remember uh you know just as a reminder gender refers to uh a person's identity how they understand themselves uh, a bit earlier i used the word feel feel is not accurate uh think is not accurate either uh because thinking and feeling are only parts of uh the whole experience of being a person uh gender refers to that whole experience which we can call identity or self identity uh what do you identify as uh and these are the most common choices or the most common responses and these are also the four responses i put in the uh question that you are answering so uh man woman you understand these non-binary doesn't mean neither man nor woman it simply means that uh what the culture associates with being a man or being a woman uh does not have that kind of attraction or identifying effect on this person so like you know when if i talk about like oh men often do this uh the men who are who are listening to this you guys um will naturally think is that true do i do that and if i say oh women often do that then the women who are listening to this you know the the girls who are in our class will naturally think is that true do i do this but for a non-binary person uh they don't have that uh reflex because they uh don't identify as like when i give you a model of a man or a woman the non-binary person does not identify with that model nothing about that model speaks to them they don't see themselves in that model uh but that doesn't mean that they are neither man nor woman it, because of course every person uh can express uh stereotypically or traditionally uh masculine or feminine behavior or thinking or responses uh but you know simply having a masculine thought does not make you a man um it's a, as i was saying it's a whole person experience identity uh kind of thing kind of category uh the fourth one gender fluid some people think of as uh they're not sure so you can be sure that you're not you're non-binary you're sure that when we talk about men or women none of that speaks to you you don't find yourself in that discussion uh but some people uh are are not quite sure yet sometimes they identify uh with the model of men sometimes with more with women uh it's not stable that's one understanding uh another understanding is that 
their gender is gender fluid. So they're sure, and they're sure that uh, sometimes they identify more with men, sometimes more with women. So it's not non-binary, which is neither. It's more uh, uh, harder to categorize as a whole. So in parts, sometimes men, sometimes women, but as a whole, doesn't really fit cleanly into either. Um, now, of course, when we talk about fitting cleanly into a category, nobody fits cleanly into a category 100%. Uh, but usually we fit into uh, categories enough that we, we think, oh yeah, that, that's talking about me. Um, and for gender fluid people who are sure that they're gender fluid, uh, that's not the case. Now, if you look up gender on Wikipedia, it's really, really confusing because not everyone uses the same words to mean the same thing. And also, the, uh, research has shown that even people who identify as uh, one gender, sometimes late in life or even early in life, uh, suddenly or gradually shift genders. And they can shift back. It's just really confusing. Uh, so the safest thing to do, as I mentioned at the beginning, is whatever the person says they are, uh, agree and respect uh, how they see themselves, how they identify. Now, uh, gender is commonly thought of as not biological, like not based in the body. Uh, but more recent research has shown that there is a basis in the, uh, in the brain chemistry. Um, so when we talk about gender, the difference between sex is uh, it's not according to your secondary sexual attributes, the or like uh, your private parts. It's more about how you understand yourself. And of course, uh, this is often influenced by culture, right? Because you, you only know what you identify with when you see a model of that in front of you, or you experience what other people think of as a man or a woman. Without culture, there is no gender. Or at least you wouldn't be able to categorize people into genders. And so it's partly in the brain and partly in the culture. Uh, it's probably, uh, well, it, it's one of the more confusing of the four terms that we're talking about here. The second one, sex, is based on your secondary uh, sexual attributes, uh, your private parts. And th there are basically only three uh, categories, male, female, and intersex. Uh, so male and female you know. Uh, but So if you're talking about gender, it's man and woman. But if you're talking about the body, then it's male or female. Uh, and when we use pronouns in English, like he or she, him or her, it refers to gender, not to sex, to gender. And so what about uh, you know, non-binary and gender fluid, people who don't identify as man or woman? Well, usually uh, we use the word they in the singular sense. So and if you look back at the questions that I wrote, I refer to the author as they. Um, now in the, referring to one person. Now, uh, this can also be a little complicated because even though they here refers to one person, the verb should still be are, a plural verb. And this is because grammar is not directly related to real life. Grammar is its own system. So if your subject is plural, then your verb has to be plural, even if you're referring to one person. Uh, and if you've ever learned a, friend, a language like French or Spanish or Italian, this will make more sense to you, because those languages, every noun has a gender, masculine, feminine, sometimes neutral, or neuter, which is no gender. Uh, and these genders have nothing to do with the noun themselves or with the noun itself. It's simply a part of the grammar, and it has little to no connection to real life. Now, English uh, does not have that strict a grammar system. Uh, 
most of the language that we use in English is related to real life or directly connected to real life. And the singular they, referring to one person, is a rare exception. So when you're using they to refer to one person, the verb still has to be plural. Okay, back to sex. Uh, male, female, you, you can understand that. Intersex uh, is a broader category. Some people are born with uh, body parts from both sexes. Some people are born uh, with uh, a body part that is clearly of one sex but doesn't uh, function fully or is uh, uh, like uh, not maturely developed. Uh, so in, in the medical terminology, uh, if a person's body is not male or female by birth, like, you know, if you had surgery to remove uh, your private parts, it doesn't change your sex. But if at birth uh, your body is not cl clearly male or clearly female, then uh, you are categorized as intersex. Third thing, transgender. And this is third because it's, it describes the relationship between a person's gender and a person's sex. So basically, if your gender does not match your sex, then you are transgender. Um, so for instance, a transgender man or a trans man is someone who is not born male. Could be female, could be intersex, but when they're born, their body is not a male body. And uh, the same for a transgender woman or a trans woman, someone who is not born female. Uh, a few other terms related to transgender uh, people are uh, uh, if they choose to undergo surgery to change their uh, the sex of their body to ma uh, well not entirely match but more closely match the their gender. Uh, we can call that surgery a transition, so you have pre-transition and post-transition, uh, or you can call it uh, gender confirmation, uh, confirmation surgery, which I use in the question, which means that you're getting surgery so that your body confirms your gender, your sex confirms your gender, or you can call it a gender reassign reassignment surgery which is, again, basically shifting your sex uh, to accord with gender. Um, and, of course, even if a transgender person doesn't have surgery, they, they are still transgender. And even if a transgender person does have surgery and their body is uh, fully uh, reassigned, they are still uh, transgender. Uh, because uh, gender, uh, especially sex, sex refers to the body at birth. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, a lot of difficulties that transgender people have in life even after they get surgery um, because they've been raised as one gender uh, because, you know, people usually assign gender according to sex and only later do people realize, oh, there, it might not be the same, the sex and gender might not be the same. Uh, so through most of life, they've been raised as the opposite gender. Uh, so that's like asking, uh, uh, like, you to live life as the opposite gender. It's not easy to do. It may even be impossible to do completely. Uh, and so even after a transgender person like comes out of the closet or has surgery and live their life as uh, according to the gender that they identify with, uh, their behavior and their actions and their way of thinking uh, may still be a bit different from a non-transgender man or a non-transgender woman. And you might be thinking, well, wait, doesn't that mean that they're not men and not women? And I say no, because this is where we have to be careful about gender and culture. Gender, again, is how you see yourself, you understand yourself, you identify yourself. Uh, and it doesn't mean that have to mean that you are that gen you are that model, but you identify with that model. 
Now, the culture is about uh, how uh, closely or how accurately you can uh, become that model. So there's a slight difference here, and th but that slight difference creates a lot of headaches for transgender people. And the last thing is sexual orientation. The previous three are all about yourself. Sexual orientation is about who you are attracted to sexually and romantically. Uh, you have this is what uh, we usually call Q I A plus is the current term. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit, uh, but. Uh, first, I want to talk about the terms that are most commonly used today. Straight means you like someone of the opposite gender. Not It's called sexual orientation, but because we're talking about attraction, it's actually referring to gender. Uh, so straight people like people of the opposite gender. Uh, gay people like people of the same gender. And the word gay currently can refer to women as well as men. Um, the word lesbian, of course, is a gay woman. Uh, it's, it's more specific than simply gay. But it also has a more political connotation. Uh, because, again, uh, we live in a patriarchal society where a woman's place is often defined by her relation to a man and her relation to a family, raising uh, being becoming pregnant, giving birth, raising children. Uh, but a lesbian couple uh, cannot uh, become pregnant simply by having sex with no other technology or assistance or planning. Like it's possible for a man and a woman having sex to accidentally get pregnant, but it's impossible for two women having sex and two men having sex also uh, to become accidentally pregnant. And so, in a patriarchal society, uh, lesbians and lesbianism can often be seen, or not often, can sometimes be seen as threatening uh, because they don't belong in. There's no place for them in a patriarchy that sees women as connected to men or families, because lesbians are connected uh, biologically to neither. Uh, now, of course, uh, many lesbian couples do want to have children either uh, by seeking a sperm donor or adoption or other methods, uh, but we're talking philosophically and academically about the, the definition of lesbianism, and that definition can often be seen as uh, threatening to uh, a patriarchy. So it's more, it's a little bit more of a political term uh, today. If you're simply talking about a, a woman's sexual orientation, you know, if a woman is attracted to women, you could simply say that they're gay, and that's fine. Last one is bisexual, or often we simply say someone is bi, and that means that they're attracted to uh, either men or women, or both. Uh, and uh, that's not to say that they're attracted to men and women equally. Most bisexual people lean one way or the other, uh, like they're more attracted to men or more attracted to women, but they sometimes do feel attraction to the same people of the same gender. Um, the word queer, uh, in Chinese we call that kur, includes everyone else. So, uh, for especially for the less usual genders, uh, if you find yourself uh, attracted uh, mostly to those uh, less common genders, uh, you would be queer instead of bisexual, because bisexual is only attracted to men or women, or men and women. Um, and there, there are other sexual orientation terms uh, that, well, okay, I'll give you one more. Uh, okay, pansexual. Pan means all. So pansexual, you're, you might be thinking, wait, so what's the difference between queer and pansexual? Uh, 
that, that's a good question. The word queer is very flexible and fluid and can refer to any kind of sexual orientation that is not straight. It's like an umbrella term. It's a term that includes everything else. Uh, but more narrowly, as I just mentioned, it could be referred to people who are attracted to more genders than bisexual people are. Pansexual people are attracted not only to people. Uh, and this may sound a little weird at first, but uh, we have to tr keep, try to keep in mind that being attracted to or seeing attraction in does not mean that you all, you all uh, automatically want to have a relationship with them. Like we can admire someone, uh, we can feel attracted to someone without wanting to be with someone. Uh, and that is uh, what pansexual means. They can see attraction in everybody and everything. And of course, that doesn't mean that they want to like marry a light bulb, uh, but they can see how a light bulb might be sexy, that kind of thing. And if you think about it that way, uh, and you think about like the design of things like cars, or like uh, cell phones, uh, you know, you can see how some people might consider them uh, sexy or even attractive. Uh, they are designed in some sense, to attract your attention, even if it's not sexual attention. Sexual uh, attention. Okay, anyway, that's uh, a less used term. You don't have to uh, know that well. Uh, and finally, the acronyms in the middle, LGBTQIA+. Uh, there are many more sexualities. Sexuality means sexual orientation again, which means attraction to genders, not attraction to sexes. It's very confusing. Anyway, um, there are many more sexualities uh, than these few. So LGBTQIA means lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, questioning, which means not quite sure, you know, or queer, which can mean like a lot of things intersex, and asexual. Okay, here's another term. Asexual means this person feels no sexual attraction at all. It does not mean they can't have sex. It does not mean they can't be in relationships. It simply means that they are not sexually aroused or stimulated uh, by anything that they see or perceive. Um, but they can still feel uh, feelings of attraction and romance and love. Uh, okay, here's another term. A romantic, not a romantic, but a romantic. The word a, the beginning a means not. So asexual means not sexual. A romantic means not romantic. This person cannot feel romantic attraction. Uh, they can feel sexual attraction. They can be sexually aroused, but they don't have that feeling of like falling in love and wanting always to be with the same person. Again, that does not mean that they cannot be in relationships. Aromantic people can be in committed long-term relationships uh, because relationships aren't only about feeling attraction, either sexual or romantic. It's about a, many more things. And the plus, because there are many more terms. So LGBTQIA plus is a term that includes everybody but straight people. Whew, I did not expect I would be giving a sex education course today. Uh, okay, anyway, going back to the original discussion question. Do you think the author's, what do you think the author's gender is and why? And how about gender confirmation surgery? So. Uh, in the essay, the author at first uh, thinks she's a woman, and then later realizes maybe uh, her hatred of herself is because it's hatred of her gender, and maybe she's not a woman, maybe she's a man. And she starts going through the process of preparing for gender confirmation surgery, but later she, she stops, and she doesn't really say why. 
Have I been saying she? Sorry. Uh, she at first thinks she's a woman. Later, she realizes he may be a man. Uh, and so he goes through the process of uh, preparing for surgery. But then he realizes that m maybe he's not a man. And so they, the author, uh, doesn't have the surgery. Uh, but they don't really say what they identify as or what they think their gender is at the end of the essay. Let's take a look. So a week before my appointment, I returned to the exorcist. Uh, I was strapping myself down all over again. I was enacting the same story, a different genre, but still a horror show. Uh, the ending of the possession story is always an exorcism, like the ending of the transgender story is always a surgery. So here the author is starting to realize that maybe their uh, de uh, uh, deepest issue isn't the wrong gender. Maybe their deepest issue is that they have to choose, they feel pressured to choose a gender. Uh, they're saying you can be transgender uh, without deciding which gender exactly. Uh, because, you know, if you have surgery, that means you're saying to the world that my gender matches my new sex, uh, my chosen sex, my reassigned sex. Uh, and so it has to be one or the other. But maybe the transgender is bigger than just male or female. So maybe, she, uh, the author says here, maybe I didn't need an exorcism or ghost hunters or sur surgery to heal what was wrong with me, especially if nothing was wrong in the first place. So based on this, I think we can say that the author's gender is currently, at the end of the essay, non-binary. Uh, you could also say gender fluid, but we don't really have evidence that uh, they are attracted sometimes to men and sometimes to women. It's more like attraction is not the most important issue. Uh, and that, or not attraction, sorry, but identification is not the most important issue. It doesn't really matter whether in this situation I identify more as a man and in that situation I identify more as a woman. It's more like, why do I need to identify at all? And so that to me seems to be more non-binary. Um, okay, here's another term. Non-binary is sometimes shortened to NB. And if you say NB as a word, then you get NB. So if you see someone saying that they're an NB, that means they're non-binary. Okay, that's the first part. How about the decision not to have gender confirmations? Oh, we just talked about that because gender confirmation surgery fixes your gender, uh, or, or sorry, fixes your sex according to your gender. So it has to be either male or female, implying that your gender is either a man or a woman. Uh, but gender doesn't have to be, be man or woman. There are many more categories. Question four, do you think that the author is cured by the end of the essay, why or why not? Now, uh, most of your answers actually were discussing what does the word cured mean? And, uh, you know, I put the word in quotation marks precisely because I think there can be many different understandings of the word cured. If you talk about a physical illness, then cured simply means that you no longer have the physical symptoms of that illness. But when you talk about mental illness, it can be a lot more complicated and fuzzier, more, more ambiguous. Um, and it's it could be ambiguous for physical illnesses too. Uh, when we talk about illness and diagnosis and symptoms, what doctors do is they have a list of symptoms for each illness and if you have enough of those symptoms and not other symptoms, the doctor will diagnose you with that illness for the purposes of trying to help you become healthier, in other words, to cure you. But 
that does not mean that every healthy person is healthy in the, in the exact same way. Uh, people's bodies are different, people's minds are different. We can have different small annoyances or issues with our bodies and our minds that are not serious enough to fall into a category of a symptom and so isn't called part of a disease or illness. So when we say cure, uh, technically the word cure simply means uh, uh, removing symptoms in the sense that we, you change your mind or body so that the symptoms no longer appear. It doesn't mean that you become 100% healthy. Um, as my dear mother likes to say, doctors are only responsible for not letting you die. Everything else is your responsibility. Um, and actually, this kind of mindset is even more uh, apparent and clear in the United States. Um, in the United States, if a doctor tells you all the things that you can't eat or can't do, some Americans get offended. And they think, oh, it's my body, it's my choice. Uh, if I want to lead an unhealthy life, I'm free to do that. Uh, and so often you'll see uh, in, the, in America, doctors will have patients coming back for the same problems, and the doctor will give them treatment and medicine, uh, and sometimes advice, sometimes, but uh, like changing how people lead their lives is not uh, a formal part of the treatment. It's only informal advice. Uh, of course, here in Taiwan, doctors will usually give you much more holistic ones and done. Uh, treatment and advice for how you lead your life in a healthier way. Um, so, you know, it, even what it means to be healthy, what it means to cure someone, it can be different across cultures. Uh, so, if, uh, for most of you who said that the author is cured, uh, you say it's because at the end of the essay they are more able to accept who they are as a person, their identity, their body, and so the anorexia nervosa is gone, the gender dysphoria is gone. Oh, we didn't talk about that term, did we? Gender dysphoria is the medical term for feeling, having the feeling that your gender is not the same as your sex. Uh, now, I said feeling here, even though previously I said feeling is not the right word, because uh, doctors can only uh, treat you according to your symptoms. They don't know how you identify, how you experience. They only depend on what you say to them. So to a doctor, the phenomenon is your gender doesn't match your sex, and that's it. It's a dysphoria, which means unharmonious, no harmony. Uh, but this can sometimes be a problem, because if your gender doesn't match your sex, uh, theoretically there are two ways to solve this. A, change your sex. B, change your gender. And a lot of doc because and changing your sex is a lot more complicated. So many doctors, uh, even today, try to change your gender. Uh, but the problem is, if your gender is truly determined partly in the brain, then no amount of convincing no amount of persuasion will change your mind about uh, your gender, uh, and so there's a, it's related. It, there's a relation. There's an echo with the first question I asked you, which is how do the doctors treat uh, anorexia nervosa? Simply convincing someone that you love to be skinny—that's your problem—doesn't solve, doesn't cure the person if that's not their problem. If they're starving themselves for a different reason, trying to convince them that they love being skinny doesn't help solve the problem, as all of you agree. The same goes for gender dysphoria. Uh, if you're really sure that your gender does not match your sex, then no amount of convincing will change your mind. Now, the reason that this category still exists in medicine is because uh, some people, especially young kids, uh, confuse the gender, the bio, biological part of gender, with the cultural part of gender. Um, they, they sometimes think that, oh, 
Like, it's so much better to be a man, or it's so much better to be a woman, or a boy or girl, that, you know, I want to. These are the feelings that I feel. These are, this is the way to look at the world that I look at the world. And so they think that uh, I should be a man, or I should be a woman, uh, as the opposite of their sex. Uh, but sometimes, as they grow older and get into puberty and become adults, uh, that feeling goes away. And that tells us that, biologically speaking, their gender uh, is or does match their sex, but they were culturally confused. And so some people really do have uh, gender dysphoria as a medical, uh, I don't want to say illness, medical uh, situation. Uh, but it's often overgeneralized to include people who are actually transgender. And that can be harmful. Uh, and of course, uh, trying to tell which is which is very confusing, especially when a doctor is treating a young kid, because young kids uh, don't have the full range of communication tools uh, to fully express how they feel. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, situation, uh, but I think it's safest for you to remember that some people are transgender, while other people simply think they're transgender. Uh, and if you're not a doctor, uh, it's not up to you to help them decide. Uh, that could be very offensive. Okay, back to uh, question four. Uh, so, the word cure. If, for mental illness, you no longer uh, engage in behavior that prevents you from leading uh, an average functional life, that is usually considered a cure. So, uh, for instance, if you have uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, like the literal disorder, not, we like sometimes we'll say, oh, I have compulsive disorder, like, you know, I have OCD and my OCD is coming, uh, I can't stop doing this. And we're using it as a metaphor. If we really, if someone pointed a gun to our head, we could stop. But for someone who has literal OCD, if you point a gun at their head, they still can't stop. It's a mental illness. Uh, so for a person with actual OCD, a cure would basically be they can stop if uh, they try really hard or someone forces them or something. Even if they still feel that compulsion to do that thing, if that compulsion does not prevent them from living a functional life, then that is considered a cure in terms of mental illness. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, yeah, the author is cured because they have come to terms with their gender and their body uh, and they can lead a functioning, healthier life. Now for other people, other groups, uh, you gave the answer no, uh, like this group in front of us, because there's no such thing as being cured. You cannot be 100% healthy. And that also makes sense. Uh, but it also, as this group answer says, uh, I believe, here, I believe it is a lifelong process where we continuously question, explore who we are, and try to find an answer. This is also true. Uh, going back to the OCD example, if you continually feel the compulsion to do something, that means that you will likely feel that compulsion all your life. And so the rest of your life will be a struggle to keep that compulsion in check and not let it disrupt your uh, daily functioning life. Or another example, addiction. Addiction is properly understood as a mental illness because, again, if someone is an addict and I point a gun to their head, they won't be able to stop. Uh, by the way, don't point guns at people's heads. That's not the medical way to determine mental illness. Um, and so when you have people go into like uh, rehabilitation programs, uh, when they come out, they still feel the, the desire and the need to use what they were addicted to before they went in. They're simply able to keep that addiction at bay, to keep themselves from jumping in headlong into the swimming pool of addiction. Uh, and so addiction is a lifelong struggle. Uh, if you've seen uh, or if you know anything about uh, 
Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a program to help people get over alcohol addiction uh, or any kind or many other similar addiction programs. They will give you a token or a chip or a marker or like a sticker or something for uh, key, uh, like like after a hundred days sober or after three years sober, and they do that because uh, they know that addiction is a lifelong struggle, uh, and they do that to remind you of how much you have achieved and uh, how well you have been living your life for the past you know hundred days or three years or whatever it is, uh, and so sometimes you'll see people say I've been fifty eight years sober, and you might be thinking, well that that just means you don't drink. Uh, or don't use drugs or whatever, but it's not the same because even if you're 58 years sober, you still feel the attraction of that addiction. And so, for people who say no, the author is not cured because they still uh, have that situation. It's just not disrupting their life, and they still have to be able to to uh, accept and deal with that situation throughout the rest of their life. That is also true. So this is one of those questions where. Yes and no, both are true, depending on the reasons that you give. Let's take a short break. Um, I took this essay from this website called Bright Wall Dark Room. And this is an online magazine uh, that runs film essays, personal essays uh, related to films. Uh, and you can notice a few things. First of all, this picture is from The Exorcist, that film. Uh, it's a classic film, it's a classic image. The second thing you might notice is that it's listed as ED. Uh, often if you want to hide your gender or the gender of your name, uh, you can use initials. So you guys know that JK Rowling is the author of Harry Potter and that she's a woman. But the reason she chose JK instead of Joanna, which is her name, uh, is because at the beginning, the publisher was not convinced that uh, people would buy a children's book or like a teenage book about magic and wizards and fantasy written by a woman. Very sexist, I know. Uh, and so uh, Joanna had to use her initials instead of writing her uh, woman name, feminine name. In fact, she doesn't even have a middle name. The K doesn't stand for anything. Um, so, you know, patriarchy is still alive and well with us in daily life. Uh, and if you ever notice anything sexist or you encounter something sexist, uh, it's always good to speak up if you feel safe enough to do it. Question five. What function or functions do you think horror films serve for the author? In addition to entertainment or education, why else might we want to watch a film or consume another kind of art? Uh, so this question is uh, a foreshadowing of our next unit, which is film criticism, uh, which is which are essays that engage with films and how we understand films. Uh, and as I mentioned in this question, uh, most of the time we watch films for entertainment or education, so to have a good time or to learn something. Uh, but those are not the only two possibilities. So. In this essay, uh, the author first mentions that they watch horror films as a distraction because uh, nothing is more horrible to them than what they are themselves going through. So watching horror films is actually less horrible. Um, and yeah, that, uh, sometimes we do watch films as uh, a distraction or what you might call escapism, to escape daily life to put us into another world. Uh, and that is a kind of entertainment. Although, you know, the author's example is a bit unusual uh, when compared with most people. Uh, but later in the essay, the author realizes that uh, these the horror films that they're seeing say something new about their own situation uh, and their own relationship with their body. And so, when we talk about films being educational, it's not just like documentaries or like biopics, you know, biographical, inspiring stories of like, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. or like Gandhi or someone. Uh, but regular films can also teach you things. 
and not like someone saying what the right answer is. But when you see the way a person deals with the situation or comes to terms and tries to understand the situation, or even if a situation is presented to you, the viewer, without explanation, and you have to come to terms and understand the situation, these can all be uh, educational film viewing experiences in that it's not just about what you explicitly learn from a film, but how a film changes the way you think about something, or changes your understanding of something, or even changes how you feel about something, uh, can all be ways of, of learning from a film, or being changed by a film. And finally, another way, which I think one group mentioned, uh, that we uh, watch a film or consume art is as inspiration, as a source of inspiration, I should say. So that this is a bit different from education, because education is like, oh, I see that, and I learned something from it. Inspiration is more like, uh, oh, I didn't even know that was possible. It opens up a whole new uh, area in your mind for you to explore and think about. So inspiration is less about giving you answers and more about giving you new ways to ask questions. Um, and in fact, I think this is what uh, this course, Readings in English Prose, is trying to do. I'm not trying to get you to memorize these, these essays or these answers or even the questions. I really don't want you to memorize anything. I want you to think about different and new ways that you can think about essays and art in general, uh, and new questions that you can ask and, and think about uh, in art and in your own life. Um, so other kinds of art. Can you be, can you have these same experiences with like architecture, for instance? I think you can. And there's actually a, <laughs> there's actually a film about that called Columbus. It's a very beautiful film. You can check it out. Uh, if you're interested in like architecture and art films. And so what you learn from a building may not be what the same kind of learning that you learn from a, a story or a film, but you can still learn things. Like learn things about harmony and the relation between how people move through space and how different spaces change different people and create different atmospheres, or how uh, people who use a building uh, go about their lives habitually, like how they usually move through a building, how that affects their life, that kind of thing can all be learned from architecture, uh, for one example of another kind of art. And also, as this group mentions, it could be a, a source of solace, comfort, to see that, especially when you watch like a tragic or a terrible story, to see that you're not the only person suffering through this, that people have suffered through this throughout the world, you're not alone, and if they can get through it, then hopefully you can get through it too. Uh, that is also an important role that films and art can play for people. So I once had a student ask me, uh, in a literature class, this story is so depressing. Why are we reading it? Uh, the educational answer is uh, to show you that some people lead very hard lives and depressing lives. But the emotional answer is because if you also lead this kind of hard and depressing life, hopefully this story can show you that you're not alone and that people get through this and that there is still beauty in hardship, there is still meaning in hardship, even if hardship itself, it may be meaningless. Okay, question six. Let's go from the top, group three. You guys chose this sentence, or two sentences. Ghosts will always be around, whether in memories or bodies or a physical place. But that doesn't mean you can't live there. It only means you need to be careful who you let inside. And the reason you give is because it's a good summary. And that is true, it is a good summary. Uh, but to, in order to write a full essay based on this summary, you have to explore each part of the sentence. So, uh, ghosts, the different meanings of ghosts in the essay. 
cities, physical places. These are all things that you can explore further in your essay. Uh, how, how do ghosts relate to memories, ghosts relate to the author's body, and to physical places, and to film also. You can't live there. Uh, and letting people inside. So the metaphor here is a physical place like a house. So you have to explain, you can explain that part as well. And the idea of letting someone inside this metaphorical house, what does that mean? Uh, like, uh, who, whose opinions you allow to affect you, or who you allow inside your own personal uh, private life. Uh, there are different ways of explaining this. So you have to give uh, what you think the essay says about these ideas and give examples to create a more complete essay. Group 5. You guys chose the same sentence! Wow, great minds think alike. Uh, so everything I just said also applies to you guys. Moving on, group four. You guys choose, maybe I didn't need an exorcism or ghost hunters or surgery to deal with what was wrong with me. Especially if nothing was wrong in the first place. Uh, so first of all, please give me the page uh, where this sentence appears. Um, and you say you choose this sentence because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good summary of the author's final relationship with anorexia nervosa. And that is true. Uh, but as uh, I was just saying to the previous two groups about summaries, you have to explain a lot more. And also, the essay is not only about anorexia nervosa, it's also about uh, gender dysphoria, gender confusion. Uh, so you have also try to find a way to use this sentence to explain that part of the essay too. So you can think about how you would explain these words. Exorcism. In terms of anorexia nervosa and in terms of uh, being transgender. Ghost hunters. Who would be the ghost hunters in, in these uh, metaphor, uh, situations? Like maybe the doctors who are trying to treat anorexia nervosa, maybe the people who say that if you're transgender, you have to have gender confirmation surgery. Uh, and, and then of course, surgery. Surgery in terms of uh, gender and sex, but also in terms of like physical exorcisms in these horror films, the use of the body in these films. The idea of what is wrong with someone. What does it mean for something to be wrong with you? Uh, and do we really have to heal what is wrong with us? Uh, do we have to cure it? Right. And, uh, what, is, what is considered wrong? And it, do we have to go by others' definitions? Or can we define it for ourselves? Uh, and try to uh, go through the progression of the entire essay from uh, the, what happens in the beginning and then moving through the essay to the end. Writing an essay about or in response to an essay is very similar to writing an essay in response to a short story in that way. You still have to try to provide a, a summary of the parts you think are important while at the same time explaining why you think those parts are important. Group two. You guys chose the only way to not become possessed completely is to learn to live with the ghosts. And again, you, you didn't give me a page number. Uh, so this is a pretty good choice because, well, it's it sort of echoes the title of the essay. And, you know, uh, authors choose titles for important reasons. So if your choice echoes the title, you can also talk about the title, and that gives you a shortcut into what could be the main idea of the essay. Uh, and so you would talk about what it means to be possessed in the different understandings of the essay, and what it means not to exercise these demons, but to live with the ghosts. 
And the answer that you give below is a good beginning uh, to what could be a, a more complete response essay. Uh, in a more complete essay, you would give evidence from the story, uh, and you would try to, as I was just talking about, uh, incorporate uh, and summarize the progression of the essay and not just pick and choose key points, but like the direction or the flow of your essay would echo the flow of the original essay. Whew, okay, that was pretty long and complicated. Um, I hope you could understand most of what I was saying. Uh, if you are still confused, feel free to write me as always. See, group one, this is the kind of thing that you miss out on if you don't submit your answers, uh, especially that question six part. If you don't give me an answer for question six, I can't help you design an essay, a response essay. Um, so group one, again, Please write to me, tell me what's going on with you guys. See if there's anything I can help you with. Next week, we're reading another essay. Ham hey, Man. Uh, this is a shorter essay, but it may have more words that you need to look up in a dictionary. Um, so you can be prepared for that. Um, it deals with food and dementia. Uh, and, and other things also, because if an essay only deals with those two things, it would be a short and boring essay. Uh, currently, as I'm recording this, our school has not announced whether the uh, return to physical classrooms will be postponed or again, or whether uh, April 24th will be the last day of online instruction. But given the recent developments in the virus and, you know, the, the spread of the virus in the, in the Navy and, you know, people going around Taiwan, uh, I would rather play it safe and, and for next week also do uh, an online course. Uh, if uh, that creates, a, like, if on Monday... I am your only online course, and that creates a problem for you. Please write to me and let me know, um, and and let we'll see if we can make that work or if we will will return to the physical classroom. Uh, but right now, I'm leaning toward next week also being online. Um, now, the other thing is, after next week, you have to write another essay. So, if next week is an online course. That means you won't have the chance to muster up your courage and come to the front of the classroom to ask me questions about the essay. You're going to have to muster up your courage and write me a letter instead. Um, and I am always here, uh, wherever I am, checking my email, although I'm not always checking my email, but I will check my email, uh, and will reply to you within 24 hours. So if I don't reply to you within 24 hours, it means I did not receive your email and please uh, try sending me another one. Try sending me a message on Moodle. Uh, you guys know how to do that, right? Like just click my, click my name and then click uh, or something like that. And uh, hopefully I'll receive that. So uh, that's this week's lecture. Hope you learned something. Hope you were inspired to ask new questions and think about people and life differently. Uh, group one, contact me. Everyone else, uh, see you next week.